Welcome, friends, to another episode of Spreading Positivity with Mayor K. I'm excited today for my special guest, a good friend of mine, Rush Lowe. Raised in front of the mic, he worked on Broadway, film, TV. Please, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, friends from around the world, welcome Rush Lowe. Great to be here, Mayor K. Rush, good to have you here, man. Thank you very, very much. Um, I feel like uh, we've, we've been spending a lot of time together. Someone who just came into my life just a few short months ago, um, we've connected you know, very deeply, very quickly, and you've had a massive effect in my life. Um, and I'm really happy that you're here on the podcast, so thanks for being here. Wonderful to be here. So, Rush, um, just to jump into it, um, you, I know you're, you're just developed, uh, you just left an, a job of yours that you've been dedicating your life for for over a decade or maybe two. And you've just now decided to com- to commit your time and energy into this new thing called Mic Drop. Um, love to hear what that's about. I mean, I, I've gone through Mic Drop. I know personally what it is about Mic Drop. Um, so maybe you just briefly want to tell us what Mic Drop's all about, what your new direction of life is taking you. I never thought I would uh, end up here. I uh, was a television news reporter in Miami for 17 years, and I loved covering the news. I loved telling people stories. But something happened about five to six years ago that changed everything. And what happened was that a friend of mine, Ellie Nash, came into my life and he had a difficulty speaking, speaking publicly. Now, in this case, he was talking about a very important issue. He was talking about molestation. He was a a survivor of that. And he was speaking at a nonprofit to uh, really get the word out there. And he was very frustrated that He couldn't properly communicate his message. So I thought to myself, I've been on stage, been in front of the camera. I've been doing this my entire life. Why don't I use some of my skills to help Ellie? But Ellie's a businessman. So I knew that I needed to boil down decades of experience into an easy-to-use formula. So I had a lot of thought put into it. And Ellie first came to me and he gave me a standard speech. It was full of quotes and numbers and statistics. And I'm sitting on my couch in my house and I look at Ellie. I said, stop your speech. (laughs) I said, no, cut the BS. Tell me your real story. I learned something in television news that Audiences want honesty. They want you to level with them. And that's, that, that creates trust. So I told Ellie, I said, tell me your story. This was difficult for Ellie because the story itself was very painful and he had to be vulnerable. And I said to Ellie during that session, I said, Ellie, there's such great power in your vulnerability. You'll, you'll have to trust me on that. The reason I knew that was because, as you mentioned, I grew up in the theater. And at the age of eight years old, I, I stood on a Broadway stage. I was in MAME with Angela Lansbury. That was my first big break on Broadway. Yeah, tell us about your, your upbringing and your, uh, as a childhood actor and what that, what that looked like. Um, yes, my father, was a huge fan of Broadway shows. He was a dentist, an orthodontist, but he loved the theater. He loved the magic of the theater. He loved uh, the fact that art can, can, can portray the human condition in no other way. Uh, people can go in to see a theatrical production and they drop their defenses. They drop the outer coverings that we all have. And for those few hours when you're in a theater, there's truth. As I was mentioning about MAME, this concept of vulnerability on stage, there's a scene in MAME that I, that I remember very clearly where I played Patrick Dennis, her nephew who comes to live with his auntie MAME. And there's a point in her life where she's lost everything and she says on stage to 
Patrick, this 10-year-old boy, and she says, I'm a failure. And Patrick, my line was, I looked up at her and I said, no, you're not, not to me, not ever. And I sing the song, You're My Best Girl. And in that moment when a, a, a 10-year-old looks at his aunt and says, you know, you're not a failure. There's great vulnerability on that stage. And I could feel how the audience was connecting with me. And so th that was really my first foray into understanding the power of vulnerability and how it can connect with audiences. And so then many years later, I put that into effect with Ellie and he gave this speech uh, that really impacted people. And I saw that power. I didn't set out to be a public speaking coach or to develop a formula. It's not what I set out to do. Wow. So interesting. You just sort of just through being just the, the little chapters in your life led you to the the, the different um, abilities that you had, the listening of your ear. You're able to, I mean, working with you, you were just by sharing my story with you, working through the through the process, you're able to just pinpoint and pick up on this little, maybe little things that I said, where I didn't say, the tone, my expressions. Um, and have in mind, we did this, and we usually do this face to face, right? In, in the same room, we did it over on, on the phone. So you weren't able to even see any of that. But you, you really were able to just listen deeply and, and, and truthfully. Um, and able to like, guide me to where, you know, I, where I was getting stuck at and to help me rediscover my voice. It all begin, it all begins really with self confidence. And this once again goes back to my memories of the theater. I remember one time my dad took me on an audition for a Broadway show and I walk in and there were 400 other kids there. Wow. And I looked at my father and I said, Dad, I'm nervous. They all look like me. They were all as cute as me. What did I have, right? So he takes me out into the hallway and he told me something I never forgot. He said, shoulders back. Rashi's here. I want you to walk into that room with confidence. It was at that moment that I recognized how important self-confidence is, even when you're afraid. That if you want to connect with an audience, you first have to have your self-confidence, this feeling like I matter, even if you have to fake it at first. Mm -hmm. And that's why even working with you, I knew from a standpoint of a tactician that before we go anywhere with you, you got to be confident. And that's really what I do with people is that this is a confidence lifter. Because you cannot start expressing yourself if you don't like yourself. Mm. And so, you, I mean, your formula and what you believe is that no one's born a, you know, embarrassed or scared of public speaking. It's something that's developed. That fear is developed throughout one's life. Cause, and that's, and that's gets stuck, you're saying around, strictly around confidence. Confidence is that roadblock or that stops someone from enjoying or to be able to perform on stage. So, like, what, how would you say, is there a certain method or what is, what is your formula? If you, I mean, obviously, in, in short, as short as you can, what, how does that process look when someone says, Hey, I want to, you know, get more confident. I want to be able to, you know, share my story and, and be the most powerful person I could be, how did they get from you know their lowest point to their most strongest point? So in uh, mic drop fashion, I would have to respond with a story. <laughs> and I'll tell you the story of one of the people that I worked with. And there are countless such stories. He was somebody in a company who, when we were trying to find his story, basically told me, hey, look, I, there's nothing really interesting that happened to me. You'd be surprised how many times I get that answer. And every single time when people say that to me, I said, no, 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 no. Just look. And so he began to work on this formula that I created, which begins with the concept of what is my message? What am I trying to say? And then after you have a message, you have to connect that with the personal Studies have been done that people connect with stories, especially personal stories. So how does a personal story of yours connect with your message? And the most important part of any presentation or speech is conflict. What is the problem? And how are you going to solve the problem? Or what have you realized from the problem? So getting back to this specific example, when I spoke about message with this person, 
it was interesting to see him actually self-reflect and actually maybe for the first time in his life say, what do I represent? Who am I? What do I stand for? The day of the performance, because all the mic drop sessions end with a performance. We put people on stage, going back to my first love. He spoke about a story that he never shared with his colleagues, and that was he had one leg shorter than the other. None of his colleagues knew it. He showed it in the class. And he told the story that what is perceived to be a detriment is really a positive. It's all the way you look at it. And he told a beautiful story of when he was running cross country. And the coach comes over to him and says, listen, don't get frustrated. You can go around those curves faster than anybody else. Focus on the curves. It was the most beautiful story. And this came from somebody who said that he had no story. Mm. Did he have to get vulnerable with that? A hundred percent. But when he was vulnerable with that story, that room was connected with him and learned something about him that otherwise would never have been told. That is, that's, that's quite beautiful. Um, what would you say to the, the theories that people say or, that we have our stories, we have our past, but what good does it have for us to bring that story out? It's all a fantasy. We're right now we're in the present. Right now we're here. And what happened in the past happened in the past. It stays in the past. What do you say to people what to his thoughts of abilities are saying that, you know, our story is just a story that we make up. We can write any story. So why give so much energy and focus onto a, a story that's maybe very vulnerable, very, very, um, you know, um, um, take a lot of courage to say, but what does it really have to do with the present day person that's saying it over? I'm glad you asked this question. So you mentioned before how all these different chapters in my life played a role in what I'm doing today. The theater, the power of performance, uh, television news, being able to interview people and knowing that everybody has a story. And most definitely uh, my spiritual search. And in that search where I didn't grow up with really any observance level, I did a lot of studying. And one of the things that really stuck out to me is this concept that everything has good in it, meaning that everything we go through in our lives is there for a reason. And when we can look at those events and reframe those events to help other people, that is how you heal. You don't leave things in the past and try to lock it away because we see what that happens. We see people who are passive aggressive. We see victimization. And what I have found and what psychology is finding is how the beauty and the importance of reframing your life to be able to look at your life and say, no, I'm not a victim. I did go through this. I did suffer through this, but now I'm going to stand on a stage and I'm going to use that to help and inspire others. The, the great example of that is Shruli Richler, who got up on stage and spoke about obsessive compulsive disorder. Now, when I first came into his company, he was hesitant at first. What am I going to be vulnerable about? Truly has had 11,000 views so far of that video on YouTube, but more importantly than that is how many people call his office every day mm. trying to talk to him. That Every single one of us has that opportunity. Think about what you are going through or what you have been through in your life and think about how you can use that experience to help someone out, out. because there is a connection between all of us. When you can speak about what you've been through and reframe it, you create community. Someone else raises their hand and says, oh, my goodness, I went through that, too. You're not alone. I worked with someone who you know, lost a father suddenly at 50 years old and settled into a very deep depression. And when this person was able to talk about it, this person recognized other people have been through that trauma. 
that you're not alone. That's also a very big portion of this. Mm. So people are able to connect with your story, able to connect with your experiences and say, hey, wait a second. I went through something like that. I can connect with that and even reach out to these people and, and get advice, get help and just make it less, less stigmatized that whatever they're going through is not an issue and not just them, not them alone. Um, I hear that. What do you think, um, has, what, what, is there a certain consistency when working with so many people that a certain story shows up time and time again? Um, and if so, what is that? And what do you think causes that? What I love about doing this actually is that the people who need it the most are the most hesitant. Mm. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, public speaking is the world's biggest fear for a reason. Is it more about sh- the stage that's scare that's that's fearful, or is it more about sharing being vulnerable, um, airing out one's dirty laundry, as many people would say? Right. the The fear of public speaking comes from a fear of judgment, a fear of vulnerability. So that could be at a dinner table, or it could be on the stage. It's the same issue. And my theory is: is once you can own the vulnerability. You get over the fear. So I tell everybody that I work with, I say, vulnerability without structure is nonsense. If I sit here in front of you and I just start crying, what does it mean? Vulnerability with structure is power. So the commonality that I find with everyone that I work with is that there is this fear of judgment. And that can be as simple as somebody in the second grade telling you you're not smart. And they hold on to this for life. And everybody listening to this, there is no excuse for being silent. There is no excuse when you want to say something not to raise your hand. You can make excuses up in your mind all you want. I don't need it. I'm an introvert. Somebody else can speak for me. Those are all excuses. We are all here born with a voice, and we all have special gifts to offer. And if you put the work in, you should be able to express yourself. Which, by the way, is critical, I think, now. I have four children. My oldest is is uh, 15 and is in front of his phone all the time. Mm-hmm. Right. All the time. And so communication is a very personal issue for me. How do you get people from their phone and say, hey, how was your day? Hey, how are you feeling? Hey, I don't feel great. These conversations, which seem very simple, often don't take place and are so important. I see. And, well, how how are you right now using um – Though technology is such a powerful, you know, tool and it is, you know, a way of communicating and connecting with people. Um, is there a way that you're using this powerful tool of social media, of, of the internet to get your message out to be able to connect people? Absolutely. The stories that we tell with Mic Drop when we go into companies and these people tell these stories, you know, recently we went into a company where once again someone was very hesitant. We never force anybody to speak. That's one thing we never do. You have to want it. Mm. You have to want it. Uh, There was a story of a a woman who uh, says she was abused by her husband, a a National Football League star, and she didn't come to my first class. But then when she saw her colleagues working at this, she said, you know, I have a story to tell. I want to share the story. One of the ways that we use social media is this whole concept of you're not alone. So when she was able to post her video, other people could chime in and make her feel, you know what, you're not alone. Whatever that issue may be, whether it's bullying, whether it's being in an abusive relationship, whether it's mental health issues like OCD, uh, whether it's molestation, these are all issues that in the past people felt like they were all alone and they were suffering all alone. And once you realize that you're part of a greater community, that there's a world out there full of people just waiting to be helped and waiting to be inspired, 
It really helps. Absolutely. I mean, I can relate with that 100%. My story when I was sharing that it was around not be, I felt my innocent, my, my whole premise of the whole speech was that I felt very much alone during some of the darkest times of my life. Um, when I was my early teens and my twenties, even through, through my twenties, when it was, um, dealing with, Sad moments, dealing with depression, going to very dark places, and in those moments, feeling the, the most alone I ever felt. All I really wanted was someone to connect with. And from the time I've um, given my speech, and Mike Strap has posted it on social media, many people from all walks of life, different ages, have reached out. Um, you know, with a lot of support and love, but also with, hey, you know, we're so glad that this is being talked about. The stigma of depression is being talked about and that's, and that should be so long gone. It's such, such an important topic to bring up to so many young people who are, and even adults who are going through, um, sad moments, going through depressed states, who feel alone and to open that conversation, to let people know that I'm here or that there are people who are going through similar or same, however different in everybody's particular opinion, uh, cases that there are people who are going through this and we can all lean on each other. We all could connect with each other. So I think it's an incredible work that you're doing and I firsthand have experienced um, you know your listening ear and your guidance and it's been really truly um, incredible and impactful in my life in, in a very positive way so I mean kudos to you and it takes such bravery because again you've you've you're you're living a life you are a news reporter for a local news station back in Florida for so long and now to say I'm putting all my eggs in one basket and I'm gonna go in and you know take a risk with this it's quite quite amazing once again I didn't I didn't intend to be on this mission, but we spoke about message, yeah, which is so crucial, everyone. What do you stand for? And for me, it was very clear. My father always taught me to fight for the underdog. He, <laughs> he was very into that. He was a Rocky fan. He was a Rocky fan. In fact, Rocky's you know one of my favorite movies. And if you notice, I'm so glad you brought up Rocky. I tell this to some of my clients. If you notice at the end of Rocky 1, he's fighting Apollo Creed. And his victory wasn't that he won the fight. It was that he hurt Apollo Creed. I believe it was in the 11th round. He mm. hit him in the rear. He, he hurt. And that was a very clear message to me. It's not always about winning and losing. Life isn't so simple. It's about staying in the ring and fighting and not giving up. So my father was very into this concept of fight for the underdog. We lived in Westchester, New York, but he went back to practice Dentistry in the South Bronx. One of the first dentists to work on patients with HIV. Underserved populations. That He would always tell me, Rosh, we are here to serve the creator. That's why we are here. So that is clearly my message. Whether I was doing mic drop or whether I was walking down the street. My message is that we are here to serve the creator and we use our gifts to do so. And that clearly came from my father. And when this goes back to somebody like Ellie, who clearly was in pain, not only from his trauma, but from the fact that he literally could not express it. Literally. And when you're able to help somebody out who's in pain, there is no, for me, there is no greater feeling. I mentioned that my dad was a dentist. I asked him once, I said, why did you become a dentist? He said, uh, when he was eight years old, he asked God to put him in a profession where he could help people's pain. And if you've ever had a toothache, you know oh, what that's like. Sure. And I remember <laughs> as a child sitting in his office and seeing patients come in with these blown up faces and walking out and saying, thank you, doctor. Thank you, doctor. And I always said to myself, I, I, I want to I wanna help people. And for many years, I did that as a television news reporter. But one of the reasons that I'm on this journey, quite frankly, is I feel like there are so many people who need help. And I see it every day mm. that, that desperately need this. Yes. Are, could they be hesitant? Could they say, no, I don't want to be vulnerable? No, of course. Eventually, though, as this gets bigger and bigger and bigger, they're going to say, you know what? That person stood up and told their story. I deserve to tell my story, too. And what happens after that person says their story? What's like the next, the morning after? How does that look like? And how could someone implement that into their daily life and have an effect with, in their life and the community around them? 
One of the reasons that we put the stage component into Mic Drop is to cement the experience of self-confidence. There is nothing like, and you know this from being on that stage. Absolutely. Having that spotlight on you, it's your voice, it's your moment, it's your time. So one of the things we did is that we said we want to give this to people. We want to give them a safe environment where they can really speak their truth and gain freedom from it. What follows that and what we're doing now at several companies is follow-ups where those same people will lead workshops, will lead team meetings, will lead retreats. It's actually those people become speakers themselves. And that's really what the beauty of what Mic Drop will evolve to become is that we are going to create a community of speakers and I have a feeling that people will relate very well with these speakers who had such a fear, were able to overcome that fear and want to learn from them. Amazing. That's, that's, that's really incredible. And for those who are listening, do you have any tips about someone who's right now finding themselves in a stuck place, somewhere where, you know, they do feel alone or they're sad or they're going through something that they just have been bottling up for a while? What would you say? Are there any quote unquote simple or, or things of action that they can do right now that could help them get out of that state and, and bring them to a road of, of recovery or, or in freedom? So the first step is self confidence. The first step is actually looking in a mirror. And saying, I am a special creation. I'm worth something. Before we get into speaking, communication, without that, none of the speaking in the world, no coaches are going to help you. You got to look yourself in the mirror and say, I matter. I'm worth something. And I mean something. That's the first thing that, that you should do. And then you should sit back. And this is in the workbook where I talk about ego is – you need to have a little bit of an ego. What makes me good? What makes me special? If it's not readily apparent, think about it. Because I believe everybody has something that is special about them. What happens often, and this goes back to fighting for the underdog, is life tries to rip that away from you. I've heard things as simple as being rejected in kindergarten, right. <laughs> being called stupid, being bullied, being put down, and it strips you of your ego. So I think that what happens with many people is that this beauty, their, their essence is covered over by a lot of dirt, if you will. And one of the things that I love to do is I love to clear the dirt away and to show them who they really are. The dirt isn't you. The dirt is what life has put you through. The real you is underneath that dirt, and if you clear it away, you can shine. So I would first tell people who are going through this is to wake up and and to really appreciate who they are. Think about what makes you special, and then you could go into what is my message? What am I here for? What do I, what do I want to convey to the world? You mentioned the word ego, and I think when people hear, hear ego, um, it brings up one definition, but it seems like you have a different definition of how you apply the definition of ego to this, uh, to this process. Ego, in terms of this process, means feeling good about yourself, feeling that you're special, that you have something to offer. I have worked with so many people who really feel, when you break it down, they have nothing to offer. And this is what I want to change. I want people to feel like they, they matter and, and, and they do have something to offer, even if you have to pull it out of them. Yeah. I, I mean, I remember I wasn't such an easy, uh, easy customer. You're, you're, you're on top of your game. I was in a place where I felt really stuck. Um, and, uh, and you were just not, you did not let up. You did not let up. You were giving calls, texting, following up, making sure I did the work. And that's what it is. It is a lot of work. It's not just getting up, writing a speech and, and saying it over. It's, it, it's the process of working with you, um, really gets deep down into the, in the crux of what's stopping a person, myself, myself. What's stopping me from, you know, speaking truly, speaking from the heart, being authentic, connecting, you know, my voice, my passions into, and, and to, and for it to, to live beautifully through my actions as well. I want to clarify about this that our formula and technique is not about revealing deep dark secrets. Mm, that's a good point. Could be. It's really about revealing what you are passionate about. It's 
not about standing up there and revealing a deep secret that no one should know. No, let me clarify that. It's not. It's about what are you, what are you passionate about and why? Finding out your why. Finding out your why. Why are you passionate about that? So when people would ask me a question, well, why do we have to go back to a difficult situation in our lives? And what's the purpose of that? Let me give you the example of Yassi Simpson, who just recently spoke. We offered mic drop at Yassi's company three years in a row. He refused the first two. He went through many difficulties in his life, which he spoke about on stage and did a whole speech about running a race and crossing the finish line. Those difficulties he kept inside, which included being fired from multiple jobs. But at the end of that speech, he crossed the finish line. And there is, there is liberation in that. There is freedom in that. And so if you're short-sighted, what you say is, why bring it up? But if you really are looking to grow, work through it, find the positive in it, speaking of positivity, and own it in front of people. So what we're essentially doing is creating a safe space in a public environment. Mm -hmm. I hear that. And the, there's a certain element of sharing publicly that one could gain more or differently than sharing, let's say, one-on-one with, let's say, a therapist or with, um, with a friend. Is there something about, you know, sharing on a, on a more general public stage that brings out a certain element from the person that, um, that they couldn't get any other else? This goes back to the issue of, of community of all those people watching these speeches and helping people. See, our experiences, I believe, are meant to help and uplift others. That what we go through is meant for us to take and to use it to benefit others. This goes back to what my father was saying, that you're a servant of, of the creator. How can you use your life experience on a macro or micro level, how can you use that experience and help out your neighbor or your neighbor's neighbor? One of the easiest ways to do that is to get on stage and speak about it. Mm. Because being silent about it lessens the potential for impact. And so this is, yes, about impact in the world. Yes. Wow, fantastic. And what's, what's, what's next for you? What's next for you? What's next for my trap? What's next for bettering this world and spreading positivity? Once again, this goes back to creating a community, uh, getting people to go to our YouTube channel to, uh, watch our videos, be inspired, give us feedback. Uh, this, this goes back to, uh, this experience that people feel when they see one of these performances where, they feel a part of people's transcendent experience. And my hope is that although I got into this profession really just out of a, a desire to want to help people, that this initial desire will be spread and we will create speakers who will, who will affect other people. That there will be a great domino effect where no longer do people have to feel A, that they're alone, or, or be that they're not worth something. And we really believe we can do that. Wow, incredible. Where can people find you? What's, what's your handles on, on social media? It's Mike Drop with Rosh Lowe, R-O-S-H-L-O-W-E. Uh, follow us at Mike Drop on Instagram. We have a YouTube channel where at every one of these performances, we upload the videos, including Mayer's video. Yeah, you can go check it out. It's on there. Uh, but most importantly... I don't want the podcast to be about mic drop. I want it to be about the people listening uh, to this. And I want them to know that I want you to have hope uh, if you're listening to this. If there's one person who can get hope from this and realize that their story matters and that their voice matters and people want to hear your story, then our time together is worth it. Thank you very much, Raj. Thank you very much for your time and for using your abilities to – 
you know, spread positivity to bring um, a lot of joy and, and true, genuine peace of mind and happiness to the people who cross your path. So thanks for being a lamp ladder. You're a rock star. A real pleasure working with you and calling you a friend. And for all those who haven't checked it out yet, check out Mic Drop uh, with Rush Lowe on YouTube, on Instagram, on Facebook. Lots to begin. You can check out my uh, story up there as well. I'm very proud of the performance and really happy that I um, – you know, got the confidence through the work to be able to share that with, um, with all you all. So check it out. Send lots of love. And again, Rush, thanks for having, having you take, taking your time and spending time with us today. Thank you, man. Wherever you find yourselves, have a great day. Stay positive. Be happy. I'm Mayor K. Have a great day. Mm-hmm.